think they wanted me on that. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Yes, correct. My name is Larry Summers. I am delighted to w welcome Jason Furman uh, to the forum at uh, the Kennedy School. Jason is probably the preeminent economic policy thinker and doer of his generation. He has been a stalwart of President Obama's administration since eight months before it began when he became the economic policy director of Obama for America. Subsequent to that, he served as uh, the deputy director of the National Economic Council for the first uh, two years of the Obama administration during the time that I was head of the National Economic Council. And I have worked with many, many people, none uh, more able, creative, hardworking, analytical, and political sa politically savvy than Jason Furman. Subsequently, he became assistant to the president for economic policy, working within uh, the National Economic Council under Gene Sperling. And then in August of 2013, he became the chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, where he serves as the principal advisor to uh, the President on uh, the economic analysis of a very wide range of policy issues and where he has become something of a national oracle on questions ranging from the prospects for future economic growth to understanding the impacts of greater social inclusion on uh, economic uh, performance to uh, issues relating uh, to uh, inequality. As chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, he bears primary responsibility for the annual economic report of uh, the president. Jason does all of this uh, following a, uh, although he is still a young man, uh, distinguished economic career in economic policy, working at the National Economic Council during President Clinton's administration, working in uh, the World Bank uh, in the late 1990s, serving as a visiting professor at virtually every distinguished East Coast University for a brief interval uh, <laughs> during the 2000s, and becoming a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and uh, the director of uh, the Hamilton uh, Project for the two years before the Obama campaign uh, began. Jason, it is a great privilege to be back with you and to welcome you to the Kennedy School. Uh, thank you, it's great to be uh, back at Harvard and you know, I'll try to live up to at least one-tenth of that introduction. I should say that Jason holds a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD degree uh, from uh, Harvard University, and he has made Harvard, and he has made Harvard proud. Um, this is billed as a conversation between uh, Jason and uh, me, but my sentences are going to be interrogative and I imagine his will be uh, declarative. Uh, Jason, um, what do you make of uh, the prospects for US economic uh, growth? Over the last five years, the unemployment rate has come down by almost five percentage points, and the economy has only grown at below two and a half percent. So it has to be the case that much or most of that growth is cyclical, coming with 
the five percentage point reduction in unemployment. And so if the growth is two and a half percent and even half of it is cyclical and one can make a case that more of it is uh, cyclical, isn't the evidence that we're looking at a pretty serious issue of slow economic growth going forward? And if that's right, why didn't the economics profession understand that a few years ago when everybody was confidently saying that potential growth for the US economy was close to 2.5%? So I would be, um, I mean, one of the ways to be an oracle in economic policy, by the way, is take anything Larry would say about the economy and try to frame it a little bit more optimistically <laughs> than uh, he would have. Um, and on this, I would be um, cautiously optimistic about the future of US um, economic growth. I'd be cautious because one, we can never be um, certain. The most important factor in growth is how much you innovate, how many new ideas you have. And if there's anything that's really hard to predict, it's things people haven't thought up yet. Um, and I'd be cautious also because I think it depends on the choices we make. Um, the choices we make in terms of investments in infrastructure, reforming our tax system, international trade, education, a whole wide range um, of other factors. I'm less taken by any conviction around the negative case, which is the way you at least framed your, your question or provocation. Um, in part because I think the last five years have been um, a very special and unique time and not one that I would extrapolate um, forward from. It was in the wake of the worst crisis since um, the Great Depression. That crisis took a really big toll on business investment. So if you actually break down productivity growth in the last five years, the weakness has not been in total factor productivity, the total amount of output you can get for a given amount of capital and labor inputs. The weakness has been in business investment. And I think that's important because I don't think the last five years of business investment is a good way to predict the next five or 10 years um, of business investment. I think there's a lot of reasons to think an economy further away from a financial crisis, businesses more able um, to invest, banks more willing to lend, um, an economy with stronger demand that justifies um, and merits stronger investment and less uncertainty. A whole range of reasons um, to think that we can't extrapolate out from that. So, um, you know, number one, um, don't have confidence in the negative side of the case because I wouldn't extrapolate out from the last five years. Um, number two, I look around at the economy and I see a lot of really exciting developments. Um, I see them in technology with cloud computing and mobile devices with advanced materials and nanotechnology, with personalized medicine and genomics, in the energy sector, with um, extraction of energy from unconventional sources as well as reduction um, in uses, and also a dramatic slowdown in um, health cost and health cost growth. And I think all of those structural factors uh, give me um, a decent amount of cause for optimism about the future. Let's be a little more um, precise. Uh, the adult population, which traditionally has grown at one and a half, two percent, is going to grow, depending on exactly how you measure it, at about three tenths of a percent over the next uh, tw over the next twenty years. Labor force participation for most groups has been uh, trending downwards even before, there's a re even before there was a recession. And people work a bit fewer hours each year just because that seems to be part of progress. So labor input's not going to grow much at all. Um, so it's all going to have to be output per, output per hour. And output per hour is run well under 1% of late. Do you think the economy is going to grow 2% on average over the, over the next uh, 10 years, um, recognizing that it's kind of going gangbusters now if you look at the employment, re employment reports, but most people expect first quarter GDP 
to be somewhere below one and a half. Um, so what do you expect the growth rate to be over the next decade? Well, one of the misfortunes of working at the Council of Economic Advisors is you get to produce um, the annual forecast that underlies the budget in cooperation with OMB and Treasury. So we have put our number on it, uh, which is 2.3% over the next decade. That comes from the type of growth accounting exercise that you were just going through. Looking at GDP growth comes from how much output you get per hour and how many hours. The hours depend on the number of people, how many of those people are working, and how much they're working. Um, as I put all those together, I don't know that I was doing it very differently than you were just implicitly. Um, the growth in the number of people will certainly be slower um, in the future, and that has a far-reaching set of economic implications. My colleague, um, Jim Stock, who's here, um, was at the Kennedy School um, at the Economics Department now, has taught me an awful lot about them um, and done a lot of research on them. So the biggest difference between our economy now and, for example, um, the fabulous growth Reagan had in the 1980s was simply that the prime age population under President Reagan was increasing at nearly 2% a year. Um, now the prime age population is actually declining. So you want to adjust for that. Um, first of all, once you've adjusted for that, um, we could have productivity growth above 2%. Um, hours roughly stabilizing, participation stabilizing. But a lot of that's going to depend on our choices. Um, you know, you talked about the participation rate declining. If we had more support for child care, more flexible workplaces, and less of a tax penalty for secondary earners, um, we wouldn't need to see the same types of decline in the participation rate that you were building into your forecast. Is your 2.3% estimate an estimate that corresponds to your best guess of what will happen, or is it an estimate of what you think will happen if all the wise policies that your administration has proposed, you know, immigration reform, uh, support, for, uh, support for working women, uh, trade agreements, tax, uh, tax reform, uh, is the 2.3 an estimate of what's going to happen, or is it an estimate of what would happen if all your good ideas were implemented? Uh, the longstanding convention of administration forecasts is that they're based um, on the president's policies and assuming the enactment of the president's policies, which um, I fully expect to happen. You do. Uh, I hope you're... Uh, <laughs> Hope your economic forecasting is better than your political <laughs> forecasting. Um, though I share your hope that many, in, in, in the vast majority of cases, I share your hope that the policies will pass. Suppose the president's policies were not to pass. And suppose we were to remain um, roughly gridlocked. And, you know, when there were hurricanes, we voted emergency. We, we voted emergency assistance, and when there were wars, we sent our troops to them. But we didn't undertake unforced moves to improve economic uh, performance. What would your estimate? What would your estimate of the growth rate of the American economy be then? I don't want to sort of recompute a forecast here in my head, right on stage, but it would certainly be lower uh, than what I said. It's going out on a limb. Um, <laughs> The <laughs> and how much do you think it matters to America's position in the world if we're growing in the 2% range rather than the 3% range that we used to think of as normal? I think, first of all, you do need to adjust it for the change in the population. If your population is growing at 10% a year and your economy is growing at 3% a year, Know, people are going to be a whole lot worse off year after year. Um, if your population isn't growing at all and your economy is growing at 3% a year, um, people are going to be better off. So just for the position of Americans within the United States, um, you need to make that adjustment. And if you make that adjustment, one, you wouldn't expect to see as much growth if the workforce isn't growing as quickly. And number two, you wouldn't um, need to see um, as much growth. Now, the workforce itself you know, is not a 
demographic fact that's inscribed in stone. It depends on our choices. And one of the most important choices it depends on is immigration reform. And that slowing growth of our population is one of the big motivations for immigration reform, um, which we can come back to. Um, the second issue, which is just relative standing of the United States in the world, and the United States has at market exchange rates the largest economy in the world. It will always have one of the largest economies in the world, um, but we're never going to have um, the largest population in the world. And so at some point, um, you'll see you know, some set of changes. And as long as those changes are the United States continuing to have the lead role um, in the world, setting a transparent set of rules and norms, an economy on the model that's been successful for us and so many other countries in the last decades, um, I think that I think that could be a perfectly bright future for us and for the world. Someone said to me the other day that the only economy that's grown as rapidly in the world as China, or close to as rapidly as in the world as China, on a per capita basis, was Richistan. Richistan being defined as the top 1% of the American population that has seen income growth over the last generation at the six to seven percent a year basis uh, in real terms. What, what's your way of understanding how that's happening? Uh, how big a problem do you think it represents? And if you think it represents a problem, what do you, the president and you want to do about it? When you start talking about the share of top income, of income going to the top 1%, um, for some people that can sound you know, your begrudging success. People have all sorts of great ideas. They get rewarded for them. Um, I think if you do the dual of it and talk about what share of income is going to the bottom 90%, um, it was 68% in 1973. Um, it was around 50% in 2013, so from two-thirds of the economy going to the bottom 90% down to half of the economy um, going to the bottom 90%. You combine that with the fact that productivity growth since 1973 was slower um, than the decades before it, and it means that incomes for the typical household are going up at about four-tenths of a percentage point per year according to the most expansive definition of income produced by the Congressional Budget Office. Um, to me, that seems untenable. Um, substantively, to some degree, that's a value judgment. To some degree, that's a judgment about what it means for the future of our economy. When you compare it to the 3% income growth we had in the decades before it for median households, or when you compare it to, as you said, the 7% growth you see for households um, at the very top. So I think you know, once you frame it that way, to me, it seems like a rather urgent public policy problem. Um, that problem, though, I would define as what you can do to raise the incomes of the middle class. Um, part of that is going to be um, a more progressive tax system because um, that's one thing we know how to do. Um, a more progressive tax system, I think, doesn't just affect the after-tax distribution of income. I think programs especially that aimed at households with children, like the Earned Income Tax Credit, have been proven to have um, benefits for income mobility for how children do nutritionally, how they do in school, and thus um, how they'll do in um, the next generation. The larger goal, though, is a set of policies that would more directly affect um, before tax incomes. And they're a little bit harder to quantify. They're a little bit harder to understand. And, you know, to some degree, they're anything that raises growth. So I think of you know, trade, to talk about something we had mentioned before, I think of that as a middle class policy, because I think it's part of remedying the slowdown in productivity growth we've seen in the last several decades, um, getting it to rise. And if that pie was expanding more quickly, um, it could raise incomes. We have a number of instruments that work better at the bottom. For example, raising the minimum wage. Moderate increases in the minimum wage make um, perfect economic sense um, at a time right now. You know, everyone would love to see more bargaining power um, for workers. The decline in unionization has directly mirrored the decline in the share of income going to the bottom 90%. Um, but you know, thinking about bargaining both in terms of unions and more broad um, than unions is an area that I don't think um, you know, we 100% understand the full set of policies 
that are um, you know, feasible and, and would substantially work there, but in some sense is the biggest prize in this area of all. It's a very thoughtful Washington kind of answer. The in the <laughs> in the following in the following sense, uh, you said very powerfully that the share of income going from the going to the bottom ninety percent had fallen by fallen from two thirds to one half, which is about sixteen percent of total income. So the GDP of the United States is about sixteen trillion. For a variety of reasons, you shouldn't count all that. So let's count twelve. Tri let's count twelve trillion as income that goes to people. So sixteen percent of that is two trillion dollars. The whole earned income tax credit is fifty billion dollars a year. Um, so, are you? Does the set of stuff you talked about amount to much? against a $2 trillion swing? And how do you think about what caused that $2 trillion swing? Mm -hmm. Let's look at the very bottom um, and look at poverty. If you measure poverty just based on market income, don't count taxes and transfers at all, which is so it's something different from the official poverty rate, you basically see it unchanged from 1968 through the present. If you take into account taxes and transfers, the poverty rate has declined by 40%. So there, you're obviously talking about a smaller fraction of the income you were just describing and a smaller fraction of the people um, that we were just talking about. But policy has made quite a large difference over the last 50 years um, in dealing with poverty. Now, over the next 50 years, do I think I'd be satisfied if we come back here 50 years from now um, market income-based poverty is the same as what it was in the 1960s, and we, I can t report again that we've made another 40% reduction using taxes and transfers. Of course not. Um, we need to do uh, to make changes in terms of income. Um, that's the at the very central, bottom. As you, as, you, as you go up the income scale, it becomes harder. That's good, but the, you know, the central political, if I might, the, the central political problem in some ways for the political party that you and I are members of is not like everybody thinks we really care a lot about the poor and have delivered really well for the poor. The, the problem I is think that they for all think the first and an awful lot of people are unconvinced about the latter in part because they don't look at the type of data I just talked okay, about. Some people don't think we've delivered for the poor, but they think we care about the poor. The problem we have as a political party is that um, people who work in cities in the Midwest and who belong to unions and are genuinely in the middle of the in American income distribution used to think we were on their side, and now they don't. And that's related to your four-tenths of a percent. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to understand what our what our what how you see our strategy for the 1.6, you know, to get at yep. that two trillion, to get at that two trillion dollars I'm prepared to believe that with 100, 150, 200 billion dollars, you can do important things for poverty, and we are, and we'll do more of those things. But what about the inequality that is an important part of why middle class living standards aren't growing? Do you think it's plausible right. to aspire to reverse that? So, so having tried to narrow your question down to poverty, let me broaden it to income as a whole. Because I think it is really important to understand that that zero point four percent growth isn't just because of the rise in inequality, although that's an important part of it. Um, in the last economic report of the president, we did a decomposition. We did a thought experiment that said, number one, what if productivity growth had grown from 1973 to the present at the same rate it did from 1948 to 1973? And what we found was if you just did that thought experiment, incomes would have been 60 percent higher in 2013. If you had frozen the share of income going to the bottom 90% at what it was in 1973, incomes would have been about a quarter higher. And if you'd continued to have an increase in participation rate the way you'd seen for women, um, they would have been about 5% higher. So all three of those factors, the overall productivity growth of the economy, number one, 
inequality number two, and participation, the number of people who are working, number three, are what's shaping incomes. And I think we need to operate on all three of those dimensions. Number one, in terms of productivity, we don't have any way to raise productivity by 10% next year to remedy the problem you said. I think we have a lot of things that could raise productivity by two, three, four, five tenths a year, and then after a decade or two, um, that really accumulates up quite a lot, and we've alluded to some of those already in our discussion. Um, in terms of inequality, there, you know, the, you know, I think education has played an important role, the slowdown in educational attainment. Again, expanding preschool isn't gonna change those incomes tomorrow, but it's going to, first of all, fulfill a notion of equality in terms of equality of opportunity that almost no one would debate. <laughs> and second of all, have large benefits in the future, and third of all, have some collateral benefits today in terms of enabling uh, more, more parents uh, to work who choose to work. And um, you know, finally, I, I think there's a lot of policies, I mean, preschool would be a good example of it, that operate on all of those dimensions simultaneously, um, that expand growth, that reduce inequality, and that help more people participate in the labor force. Um, there's certainly things where there's trade-offs um, between the three and where there are, we should evaluate them in terms of what they do for the incomes of middle class and those trying to get into the middle class. But before we even get to the trade-offs, there's an awful lot um, of low-hanging fruit that isn't gonna solve the problem overnight, but by tenths and tenths accumulating over years and 10 years and 15 years um, really will make quite a profound difference. Jason, let me ask you a, a different kind of question. Um, you uh, studied for a PhD in economics here. You wrote a very good thesis. You were a very, very good student in your graduate courses. And then you found yourself in this, you spent most of your career in this rather different world of practical uh, economic policy. Tell the students here uh, do you use the models and the math and all the stuff you you learned about in getting your PhD in uh, in getting your PhD as you advise the as you advise the president, or do you use your political skill and common sense? <laughs> I think. Um, the set of arithmetic and identities that you learn um, gets you, my numbers aren't gonna add up to 100, so I'm gonna contradict this very first one that I said, um, gets you about 40% of the way. Um, the number of statements you hear, not from the president, um, who really genuinely does understand these issues very deeply, um, but the number of statements you hear about trade, for example, that don't recognize the set of national accounting identities related to the connection between savings investment and the current account deficit, or um, incomes that don't understand compensation as the sum of, of wages and benefits, and a set of identities like that gets you pretty far. Um, you add to that a certain amount of the price theory. Um, you learn in introductory economics, so when the price of something goes down, you know, the demand for it, um, goes up and, and the supply of it goes down, that gets you probably another 20% um, of the way there. In any given area, um, there's a lot of um, tools you learn. So, you know, econometric tools that will give you um, a way of dealing with something, thinking in terms of, you know, differences and differences or how to identify um, matters. There's Fewer policy issues than you like, that there's a paper off the shelf that you can find that already answers it. A lot of what you're interested in is things that have happened in the last few years that people haven't written about yet, or some policy topic like what to do about overtime that you, know, you discover most of the literature is 20 years old. So there's a lot of less that you can pull off the shelf than you'd like and more that you have to invent. Um, the last thing that I think is best about universities in a lot of ways is Washington a lot of policy discussion turns into a team sport, and there's people on your side and there's people against you. And no matter what you say, the people on your side think it's great. The people on the other team um, think it's terrible, and you suspect that the reason they think it's terrible isn't because there was some flaw in your thinking, um, but because they have some agenda to you know, destroy the economy and the world and the middle class. Um, <laughs> 
That's not the way universities function. Um, if you're in a seminar and your paper reaches a conservative conclusion, um, Robert Barrow isn't going to be any more polite to it um, as a result of that. Um, and you know, the converse is also true. So I think that habit of thinking that you get in a university, and I think you get it um, particularly well in an economics department, um, or is one of criticism, debate, exposing assumptions, trying to figure out what's right and wrong without dividing it up into what I think can be the little bit of the brain deadness of teams. And I think that attitude and discipline is one I've tried to take into policy making and really think more critically, try to figure out if things are right or wrong, um, subject things to scrutiny. Because I think if you care about the middle class, you care about the different questions we've been talking about, um, you know, you want to you want to work hard to figure out if maybe something you're doing is, is wrong or should be done differently. What worries you most about the United States economic future? It's, again, um, middle class income growth. And I would say um, I think productivity growth is the most important lever for that, both because it directly feeds into income, also because it determines um, what our fiscal future is and how much we'll be able to afford to solve the problem um, insofar as it's not solving itself. One of the things that's happened since um, you graduated from Harvard is, I think it's fair to say, is that our stu students are on average at least as idealistic as students were when you graduated from Harvard. But the fraction of them who find government to be an attractive direction for their idealism has gone down. And the fraction of them who think that working in NGOs or working in nonprofit uh, organizations or some alternative non-political, non-governmental activity is the best way to make a contribution to making the world a better place um, has, uh, has gone up. And, some of that's because exciting things have happened in the NGO sector, but some of that reflects a growing disillusionment with government as a mechanism for contributing to the world. Um, how would you respond to that trend? You know, I think it does take a certain amount of stamina to do public policy. Um, there's a set of ideas which are, you know, both sides actually agree to and you can't get done. Um, and then there's a set of ideas that are you know, screamingly obvious to me and you can't um, persuade the other side to agree with them and that you know, is even harder. And you know, nothing happens as fast as you think it should. Um, but then you have things like the last budget President Clinton put forward that, um, you know, that I worked on. We put in that um, a policy to expand the earned income tax credit for families with three or more children. Um, that came about because I called Jeff Liebman. I don't know if he's here, but um, he's certainly a Kennedy School professor and asked him what we should do about poverty. He said expand the earned income tax credit for three children. Um, I said it to Gene Sperling. Gene said it to Larry, and we put it in the budget. Um, needless to say, the budget that President Clinton put out in February of 2000 um, was not enacted in full. In fact, it wasn't enacted um, at all. I got out of the administration and continued to be taken by the idea. So. The Center for American Progress was organizing a conference on tax reform, and I decided to focus on tax reform and poverty, and centered around that as well as some related set of ideas. The Obama campaign took the exact same set of parameters in the paper that I had produced for the Center for American Progress um, policy and put it into their campaign platform. He was elected. Um, I was on the Hill negotiating a lot of the Recovery Act. I'd put the exact same thing into the Recovery Act. Um, it's since been extended through 2017, and I think it'll be made permanent. And it's benefiting about 10 million people a year. Um, you know, in some ways, that's more than you can do in a lot of NGOs. Um, in, I don't have 10 other examples like that. Um, I know 10 other people that put something else into President Clinton's budget, last budget, that didn't subsequently happen. So I'm not saying um, that that story is going to always work or work for everyone. 
Um, but certainly when I think about myself and what I do in public policy, you know, nine years was in some ways frustratingly long to wait for something that seemed like a good idea to me. Um, in retrospect, um, you know, it almost I uh, feel slightly better, um, you know, for the waiting. Okay. Um, we are now going to turn this to the audience. There are four microphones, and there are a set of uh, Kennedy School instructions that I am supposed to give, which are <laughs> that questions end with a question mark. Appropriate questions are in one part and are brief. And we will move. Uh, we will move around the. We will move around the room. I, I hate to disagree, but multi-part questions always give the answerer the opportunity to choose what to answer. Okay. Well, then, in deference to in deference to our guest, we will allow two-part questions. Uh, Mr. And Furman, please introduce yourself too. Uh, I'm Leonard Elman. I'm an emeritus professor of medicine at Harvard. Uh, Mr. Herman, you cited uh, personalized medicine as one of the bright spots in the economy. And I would certainly agree that we're in the midst of a biotechnology revolution. Uh, but one facet is the costs, uh, particularly in the area of oncologic uh, drugs. Each new uh, biotechnology medicine seems to start at $100,000 per patient per year. And many people feel that the system is unsustainable. And I was wondering how you and Professor Summers think that this may play out in the future. So let's just look at the last few years and use that to see what we can about um, the, the future. Health cost growth measured by the CPI, the amount of cost to buy an aspirin or buy a treatment, is growing at the slowest rate it's grown in 50 years. If you look at health costs per enrollee for beneficiary and health insurance, those are tied um, for the lowest on record. And then you look at total national health expenditure um, adjusted for inflation and population. The three slowest years ever recorded are 2011, 2012, and 2013. Um, of those three that I talked about, the first two are continuing um, into 2014 and 2015, based on all the data we have. The third, total national health expenditures, is having a level change up as we expand health insurance to more people. Um, but it's not one that has collateral impacts on the people who already have insurance. Their costs are continuing um, to grow slowly. So I think, um, contrary to the premise of your question, we're going through a period of slower health cost growth. Initially, this was dismissed or not recognized because people thought it was a byproduct of the recession. As the economy gets increasingly stronger, that notion is increasingly less tenable as the primary explanation of it. Um, moreover, you see the slowdown in areas like Medicare that aren't cyclical. You see it in health prices more than quantities, and prices are less cyclical than quantities. So having ruled out that explanation of the recession, which we think of as temporary, that leaves a range of other explanations, a number of which um, are permanent. I think part of it is just what we've done to the growth of um, the way in which we reimburse in Medicare. We're shifting our payment models away from fee-for-service, um, putting a greater emphasis on value on bundled payments. And so I think a number of these changes are um, in the, you know, I don't know, 80% or whatever it is, the health costs that aren't drugs are resulting in quite slow um, growth. Within drugs itself, you have contrary um, movements. You have drugs coming off patent, lowering prices. You have this set of developments um, raising cost growth. But I think overall, you know, if we get our incentives right, we can take advantage of a lot of these developments to continue to have at least some of the slowdown in health costs that we've seen in recent years um, persist going forward. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Bolger, and I'm a Harvard alumnus. Um, but a question for actually uh, both of you. Looking back historically, the United States made a decision to go off the gold standard in the 20th century. I'm just wondering, as you look at the modern economy, was there anything unexpectedly good or unexpectedly bad about that historical decision? I think the fact that after 2007, we didn't see our unemployment rate go up to 25% and lose a commensurate amount 
fraction of our output in the way that we did following a similarly sized shock in 1929 um, is in part because instead of being on the gold standard, we had flexible monetary policy. We were able to respond accordingly um, and combine that with a vigorous fiscal and financial response um, as well. I would add that uh, Jason's answer is reinforced by a consideration of the European experience and uh, the difficulties <laughs> that the that Southern Europe is having are closely related to the inability to provide easy monetary policy in response to conditions that would normally require uh, easy monetary policy and that relates to uh, their, membership, their membership in the Euro. I think, <laughs> I think in retrospect, uh, at least in the context of a world like the modern world, uh, the gold standard does not appear to be an optimally designed monetary policy system. Uh, that, that segues well to my question. Mm -hmm. um, sometime around the 1930s. Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm sorry? Your name? Oh, I'm Jared Rubenstein. Um, and around the 1930s, John Maynard Keynes made a prediction about what's going to happen in his grandchildren's generation. And he predicted that the work week would really go down and people would have a lot more leisure. But that really hasn't happened, right? Because the standard work week is still 40 hours and a lot of people work longer weeks than that. So how come all this technological progress hasn't translated into people being able to enjoy more leisure? And is that influenced by a, a bias towards maximizing GDP instead of maximizing well-being? I think a lot of this reflects choices that people make. And I'm not going to second guess that set of choices. And if somebody wants is choosing between you know, a set of consumption goods and, and a set of leisure, um, you know, that seems like a reasonable choice to make. Um, we have that income problem that we were talking about before, the combination of inequality and productivity growth that has slowed that income growth. For a while, we were able to mask that as more women came into the workforce and you had more two earner couples instead of one earner couples and that kept incomes um, propped up um, to some degree. But you know, I also think, um, while I wouldn't second guess those judgments or make those judgments really an aim of public policy, I think the public policy um, should be a little bit more towards encouraging neutrality and let people make that choice and if anything, you know, by necessity, um, public policy is the opposite of neutral, or if, if anything, um, tilts towards leisure um, and away from work. Um, you know, outside of public policy, to have a national conversation and ask the type of questions you have, it's certainly something I ask you know, myself um, as I work. It's something that you know, there's some rat race element to life, there's some relative status and income element to life, and so to have a cultural conversation about that um, seems to me like a worthwhile conversation to have. Um, it just feels like less of a public policy problem. May, may, I, may, yeah, I, just, of may I just <laughs> add, some, uh, add something? When I was an economic, an EC-10 teaching fellow here 40 years ago, we taught um, round about the sixth lecture uh, to people in their freshman year about how the supply curve for labor was backward bending. And the idea was that as wages went up, people worked more and more, but then past a certain point, you got rich, and so you basically had enough money, and so if your wage went up more, you would decide to work less and enjoy leisure because you had enough money. And that we taught that in part because that's what Keynes had said, and we taught that because a reasonable reading of the data at that moment was that that was kind of the way human behavior worked. A reasonable reading of the data today is no longer that way. People who have higher wages seem to choose to work more hours than people who have lower wages, and that seems to be the general choices that people make. And so as we've gotten richer, people can, you can get a lot more extra stuff by working for one more hour 
than was once than was once the case, and so people decide to work more. People decide to work more hours. Now we can approve of that taste, or we can disapprove of that taste. But I think the basic fact is that Keynes's guess that once you were able once you were able to earn twenty five dollars an hour in today's or thirty five dollars an hour in today's dollars, you would feel like what you should do is have more time off and you already had plenty of stuff has not actually proved to be a good prediction about uh, human motivation. And that's, that's why the prophecy turned out to be wrong. I first off want to thank you uh, both for coming tonight and speaking. My name is Eric Hollenberg. I'm a sophomore economics concentrator at the college. And um, so when he was working, when Rahm Emanuel was working in the Obama administration right around the time when Mr. Summers, you were there, as well as Mr. Furman, um, he said, never let a crisis go to waste. And he's why the quote is saying that given the benefit of hindsight and maybe the, the 2020 that it, that it gives us looking back on the financial crisis, I have a question for kind of open question for both of you. What do you think are some of the you know bigger policy objectives that the uh, uh, U.S. government and the Obama administration may have not capitalized on for a vari variety of reasons, as well as the international financial community when looking at you know the IMF or other bo other bodies. Um, if, as someone who still works there, maybe I can do what we did capitalize on, and Larry can share his regrets. Um, no, I think we did. Um, I think we did quite a lot. I think on the fiscal side, um, it's actually underappreciated because people just think about the Recovery Act which was about uh, $750 billion of, of net stimulus. And they missed the fact that after the Recovery Act, there were another 12 pieces of fiscally expansionary legislation, payroll tax cuts, hiring incentives for the long-term unemployed, tax incentives for infrastructure investment, support for teacher jobs, cash for clunkers, et cetera, that when you add it all up together was another um, about $700 billion, so $1.4 of um, fiscal support in total. And I think that vigorous response together with monetary, financial, and other policies is part of why the United States recovery happened a lot sooner than most of the other advanced economies and then most of the history of financial crises um, we've been through. You know, if I have any regret about that whole set of things, it was that each one of those things took so much work. And if just the first time we'd put in a trigger that said if the unemployment rate is still above blank, then such and such tax policy will still be extended, such and such unemployment benefits will still be extended. Um, it would have been a lot of less effort and freed us up to do more instead of sort of slogging through the trenches on passing all 12 of those measures I just described. You know, unemployment insurance for the long-term unemployed then might not have gone away um, when it went away in 2014 when Congress refused to extend it. And the time we had the next recession, maybe we'd even have those triggers in place so you wouldn't need to make the case yet again. Um, it would be a little bit more automatic. So trying to have a little bit more of a, not just the immediate response, but putting in place you know, automatic stabilizers that on a permanent uh, footing were better um, would have been something um, you know, I wished we, uh, we could have done. So I guess I inadvertently just answered your question. I'll give you a different, uh Diff different answer. Um, there's a standard technique which Jason sort of used and which I'm about to fully embrace, which is when you're associated with the administration and you're asked what your biggest regret is, your biggest regret is always that Congress didn't do something the administration asked it to. <laughs> because that way you've expressed a regret, but you've expressed full satisfaction with your administration. Um, in 2009, the United States negotiated a new set of understandings at the IMF, under which the United IMF would have more money to respond to financial crises, and in which rapidly growing countries like China would begin to have a level of influence and vote proportional to their economic scale in the world. The United States led and drove and persuaded all of the other countries to accept those changes, which were somewhat problematic for some of the traditional European countries in particular, that were going to lose share. Five years, uh, five, almost six years uh, later, 
181 countries have approved that change. So it's ready to go into effect, except one country has not approved that change. That country is the United States. As a consequence, we are holding down the capacity of the IMF to add confidence to the world at a moment when there are substantial questions in emerging markets. As a consequence, while we have all this rhetoric about shaping a new global order, the truth is that China still only has 2.5% of the vote at the IMF. And we're taking the position, we have taken the position unsuccessfully, that China should not be able to start a global development bank to do infrastructure in Asia. And they can quite legitimately ask, excuse me, you guys have had five and a half years to support a reasonable role for us in the IMF, and you have not done it. And so we have basically ushered in that change with legitimacy on uh, China's part. And it is a terrible reflection on our political system that we have not been able to find a compromise. And it is a symptom of a broader problem, which is that we have great difficulty getting the executive branch and the legislative branch together on international organizations, international trade agreements, and the kinds of steps that are necessary for the United States to be a leader uh, in the global economy. My name is Tomas Insua. I'm a student here in the Kennedy School. So my question is, when asked by Prof Professor Summers about what worries you about the future, you didn't mention climate change when in the current business as usual scenario we're expected to receive high, very likely highly catastrophic human and economic impacts as for example quantified by the Bloomberg's Risky Business Report. So my question is, in, the white, in your work in the White House, how high is it in your list of concerns uh, when doing forecasts and how does that inform your interaction with other areas of government who are supposed to work on mitigation, on climate change mitigation? Um, I, I'm glad you asked that question because it gives me an opportunity to remedy the deficiency um, from earlier. Um, absolutely, it's, it's, a, it's a huge concern um, and it's a huge priority. And you know, I think if the question had come to me as the fate of the planet rather than you know, macroeconomic variables that show up in your forecast, um, my mind might have been led to that um, rather than where it was doesn't have a huge impact on you know, the prediction for GDP growth in the year 2015 or 2016. Um, it has um, a huge impact on um, you know, our, our future. And a number of the steps, um, and this is important in terms of 2015 or 2016, a number of the steps that you can take to curb climate change also have a side effect of reducing a number of other pollutants that actually do affect um, you know, social welfare. Um, for example, asthma and a number of other um, diseases that people actually get today. So it isn't just about the future, um, it's about today. You know, we're obviously doing everything we can um, in terms of the climate action plan of which um, a set of rules associated with existing and new um, sources of emissions at power plants that um, CEA and, and when Jim uh, Stock was at CEA worked really closely on and we've continued to work very closely on um, because we you know, are convinced that the longer we wait, the more costly it is um, to deal with that problem. I'm going to take two more questions. Yes, sir. Hello. My name is Ray Fong. I'm an alumni of Harvard. Since I'm speaking to two prominent members of the Democratic Party, I would like to ask you a question I know is going to be rather tough. May I ask you, gentlemen, are there any policies traditionally supported by the Republican Party that you actually think are sensible? And are there any traditional policies supported by the Democratic Party that you think may not be so sensible? Or is it that every single policy supported by the Republicans are automatically terrible and every single policy supported by the Democrats are automatically wonderful? So let me give you um, two on that have been more associated with the Republican Party, rightly or wrongly, in terms of 
you know, if you did a vote count or you did what they're associated with. Um, one is that the United States has the highest business tax rate of any advanced economy um, in the world. I think that's problematic in terms of the location of um, global investment and economic growth in our country. I think you combine that with an international tax system that's broken that further um, impedes competitiveness. I'm now going to add a big caveat, although it's one that most Republicans in Congress would agree with right now, which is that we have that high rate. We don't collect a lot of revenue because we have a lot of loopholes. Our international system pretends it taxes you heavily, but it doesn't actually tax you at all. So it's a combination of distortion um, without what you'd normally get in exchange for distortion, which is some revenue. And so I think reforming the business tax system to bring that rate down, address some of those loopholes, and have um, an international tax system that's more globally competitive and better um, at eroding our tax base um, is a step I think would be very important to our economy. Um, second, you know, it's been a longstanding um, tradition for both political parties um, and the executive branch to support um, expanded international trade and something um, that the president's pushing very hard right now and it's something that frankly has more um, Republican support in Congress than it has um, you know, Democratic. Maybe I'll let Larry answer the other half because he would have done those too. I think that um, a preponderance of the evidence would suggest that we have substantial problems in the United States that come from a tort system that is capricious um, in its effects and is a substantial source of uncertainty for business in many business in uh, many areas and that could valuably starting from medical malpractice but moving well beyond medical malpractice uh, be reformed and I think it would be fair to say that opposition to that has there's a lot of opposition with complicated political roots but I think it would be fair to say that more than half of that opposition well over half of that opposition uh, comes uh, from the democratic side I think there are complex questions about cost-benefit analysis and regulation. And we do, in important respects, and Cass Sunstein, who's a professor here, led the effort for the first four years of the Obama administration through so-called OIRA process within OMB, uh, do cost-benefit analysis. But we should do more cost-benefit analysis before regulations go into effect. And I think it's fair to say that the pressure from Republicans has been in the direction of more cost-benefit analysis. And I think, and the corollary of that is that there's been resistance uh, from Democrats. And if I were the czar, we would do more cost-benefit analysis uh, than, uh, than we do. You know, I think humor aside and my putting one question to Jason that referenced um, the uh, political, referenced our political uh, allegiance. I think one of the things that actually is, is gratifying, and it's something that I think students are struck by in the course that Marty Feldstein and I teach together, that there is a great deal on which serious economists who've studied economists, who studied economics, agree on, regardless of some of the values orientations that lead some people to be Democrats and lead some people to be uh, Republicans. So I think it would be a very serious mistake to think of most of the content of economic policy as being economic partisan, as being partisan and that um, if you put Jason and Glenn Hubbard together, they would agree on a great deal that was in the public interest, but was not in the in, but would run into substantial political difficulty, and that the gaps between what economists think and what many others think are at least as large as any gaps between 
economists who are Democrats and economists who are Republicans. Can I just add one very small thing to that, too? I think also there's more agreement than people appreciate. When there's disagreement within the professional discourse of people that have studied the issues, I think the disagreement is narrower than it is outside it. So even on an issue that Glenn Hubbard and I would disagree on, you know, how, what fraction of tax cuts pay for themselves, you know, he, or at least Greg Mankiw, would say 15% of income tax cuts are paid for by the economic growth that ensues. You know, I tend to look at assumptions that make the number much smaller, um, but that's a lot smaller than the range of disagreement you know, outside of that, um, that professional you know, just to Just to make the point one more way, I think most people who've watched, and everyone who's watched who's been thoughtful, would feel that there's been enormous continuity between the policies of the Bernanke Fed and the policies of the Yellen Fed. This despite the fact that Bernanke was the former chairman of George W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors, and Janet Yellen was seen as somebody who was probably in the left half of uh, the Democratic Party. And I think that reflects the fact that a lot of the judgments that economists are asked to engage with are really technical and are not heavily suffused with political content. Yes. So my name is Julian Duran. I'm a first year student at the college. And my question is regarding the housing market. So it's traditionally been a strong driver of economic growth, but we know when there's excess leveraging, that becomes a problem. But subprime uh, mortgage lending nowadays is on the rise. Obama loosened mortgage lending standards last year. Uh, so my question to you, to both of you, is uh, should we contain this excess before it becomes a problem again? I think the problem we have today is um, the opposite of the premise of your question. Looked at in a wide range of ways, um, mortgage credit now is a lot harder to get than it was at the very beginning of the 2000s, which is um, before the set of bad mortgages that caused the problem were originated. Financial institutions and, you know, to some degree, their supervisors have overcompensated um, for the crisis. And so I think credit right now is still too tight. The pace of home building is about one million homes a year just looking at the underlying um, demographic growth in our country, um, it should be more like one and a half million um, homes a year. So we're underperforming relative to the fundamentals um, in terms of building homes. And then um, you know, finally things like you know, attempting to look at ratios of rent to own and, and the relative costs of those you know, aren't, you know, don't resemble the type of you know, out of whack behavior. Um, that they had in um, the housing bubble. So I think right now it's important for us to continue to take steps um, to make sure that more creditworthy borrowers get credit. Um, where I think we haven't um, succeeded, and, and uh, to follow the Larry Summers formula of answering these, is um, reforming our housing finance system that's going to put us on a more sustainable footing going forward. So at this moment right now, I think credit's too tight. I think going forward, um, replacing Fannie and Freddie with something else, putting the risk um, you know, within the financial system and within capital markets well before it gets to the taxpayers, having any residual portion being borne by the taxpayers paid for ex ante um, by fees is something that's really quite important to do and something that we're certainly trying hard um, to get done. You will have the last question. <clears throat> My name is Yuan Tian. I'm a fourth year PhD student in economics, and thanks for your conversation. My question is regarding the immigration policies. Since I want to ask both of you, what's your opinion on the recent changes in the immigration policy, and what's the effects of such kind of policy on the labor forces and on the economic growth? As an econometrician, my question is that recently there is some debate on the fundamental of how to calculate GDP and what's your opinion on the calculation of GDP? Thank you. Uh, you asked a two-part question, so I think I'm going to mostly answer the first part. Um, at the Council of Economic Advisors, we took a really close look at the immigration executive actions um, that the president took 
and tried to rely on a wide range of literature that's out there, um, as well as estimates, including estimates that the Congressional Budget Office did. And our estimate that was that it would add about 0.4 to 1.0% to GDP after a decade. It would do that in part because it would expand the, um, the quantity of labor, mostly um, on the high-skilled side by letting some people work who wouldn't otherwise work. But it would also um, improve total factor productivity, which is something the Congressional Budget Office found. You see that um, you know, most obviously with high skilled, where higher rates of patenting, innovation, entrepreneurship, job creation in the United States. Um, but I think it's also true if you take um, the undocumented population here in the United States, give them more certainty, they can move to jobs that they're a better match for, make investments in education or starting a business and a number of other ways um, contribute to our economy as well. So I think that executive action will add to the economy. Um, legislative reform to our immigration system would add a lot more to our economy, almost a factor of 10 more, at least in the lower bound estimate um, that I just gave. But that was about as far as we could push it administratively. Uh, the measurement of GDP is a very big question. I don't know what aspect of it you're getting at. But I think our statistical agencies do a very good job of measuring it as best as they can. I think within the concept they've defined, there's a lot of challenges about measuring things like Google that are unpriced. Um, and then GDP doesn't tell you everything. So you shouldn't look to GDP to answer questions that are broader than GDP. It should be one input um, into the questions that you ask. I'm going to give a, a, use your answer as a, use your question as a basis for giving a brief plug for economics. And then I'm going to give Jason a chance to say a final word so he should figure out what, th what he wants to say. Um, you know, what comes to mind in your question is an opportunity to really say how economic research makes a difference. Um, the, there was really a good natural experiment for studying immigration that happened some substantial number of years ago. Because of a set of developments in Cuba, over about a two month period, an amount of people that represented about 7% of the population of Miami all arrived at once. And so that's kind of an experiment, like you had a big increase in immigration. And some people thought you were gonna, you had only so many jobs, and if you had all these immigrants, there was gonna be much more competition for the jobs, and so wages were gonna plummet and Americans were gonna get unemployed. And other people <laughs> thought, well, it was really a lot more complicated than that because when people came, yes, they took jobs, but they also spent money and needed houses and bought stuff in the grocery store. And so it would all sort of work out. And because as a consequence of the desire of economists to do research, there was actually systematic data available that let one study every few months what wages were in Miami the question could, be really, could really be answered. And David Card, a distinguished professor at the uh, University of California at Berkeley, studied the question and essentially concluded much more the second view, that there wasn't disruption. And that doesn't resolve the question of what US immigration policy should be. And there's certainly controversy about the details of his uh, study. But I think it's fair to say that as a consequence of a study like that, most people who are honest and thoughtful have adjusted their views on what the consequences of immigration are. And I think the ability of American universities to have professors who do studies like that and the ability of our system to have economists like Jason who, when they're in government, are fully conversant with that literature and can translate it for presidents and other senior political uh, figures, contributes to our having substantially better economic policy and therefore substantially better outcomes uh, than would otherwise be the case. Jason, a final word. Uh, we heard an allusion before to um, a crisis being a terrible thing to waste. And I think in that moment of crisis in 2009 and 10, we did a huge amount. 
And because of that, I think we're very much out of the crisis. Um, we're not all the way recovered. The unemployment rate um, could go down lower. Some of the byproducts of it, long-term unemployment, the participation rate, people working part-time for economic reasons, um, are further from being fully recovered. And we have more work to do on all of those. Um, but we're way past um, the crisis phase, and we're way um, into a normal recovery. In a lot of ways, that's um, quite exciting. Um, that's quite satisfying. Um, but it also means that the next set of challenges that we have that relate to um, the set of concerns that Larry was framing in his first question around economic growth, um, the set of concerns Larry was framing in his third or fourth question about the 1.8 trillion or whatever it was of, of missing incomes um, for the bottom 90%, um, those aren't an imminent crisis. It's not that if you don't do something tomorrow, we're gonna fall off um, a cliff, or if we do something tomorrow, we could fully solve it. Um, a year from now, but they're no less pressing um, and they're no less important. Um, I think we've had a good dialogue here about a number of ways in which a lot of economists agree to a wide range of policies. Um, I'd broaden um, the field from economists. There's an awful lot of people in Washington, um, including um, you know, elected leaders from both parties and both chambers um, that agree on a, lot of, a, on a lot of the different policies um, that we've been talking about here in areas like immigration, um, tax reform, education, um, trade. And, um, you know, but that, even that isn't uh, sufficient to make it happen. Um, you know, it takes perseverance, it takes work, and, um, you know, to some degree that's expanding our understanding of it. Um, to some degree it's taking something that we've understood really well for a while now and figuring out how to translate um, that understanding, explain it to people, figure out how to navigate the system and get it done. Um, I think different people play different roles at different parts of that process. So I don't think there's a right answer to public service and NGO or you know, working um, in an investment bank and, and reading about these issues and talking about them in your spare time, but, um, you know, or, or being an economics professor. But um, you know, I think all of those can, uh, can contribute and all of those will, will have to, because I think we have a lot of potential, but you know, we're definitely not um, fully realizing that potential in a lot of different uh, dimensions that we've talked about today. So thanks for the chance to talk about all of that. Chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, Jason Furman, thank you very much. Thank you.